Colonel Mong for uh, this nice uh, sun bat. Uh, now uh, back in, in the box for uh, another uh, great uh, panel with amazing uh, presenters and I'm truly honored to uh, chair uh, this panel. Then we will uh, have the, uh, the honor of, of listening to um, Dr. Imre's poor collab uh, from uh, Hungary. He is the Deputy National Armament D uh, Director and the Chief Defense Innovation Officer. Uh, he was recently uh, Brigadier General uh, of the Hungarian Forces, and he was doing the liaison uh, between the Pentagon uh, and um, Allied Command Transformation in uh, Norfolk. And, and we are so fortunate because he just flew in, I think, this morning, uh, and he, left, he will have to run. So I just wanted to show that this is a testimony of, of his commitment uh, to design and to this, uh, this community. Um, and we will finish with uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, Vanderveer. Yes, great. Uh, he is he's a J5 planner uh, based at the German Joint Forces Operation. Uh, he is the uh, erectic uh, disruptor of, uh, of his team. Thanks, Philip. And uh, just to jump on uh, what Jeremiah said about the jazz band, uh, it's really an honor to be here and, and actually tune in and, and, uh, and have the opportunity to, uh, to talk to, uh, to this, uh, this gang again. And, uh, and, and it is indeed my honor, uh, you know, getting out from the trenches and then and, and coming in here and sharing ideas uh, with such an excellent crowd is, is always a bliss. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. I've come with, uh, because of two reasons. One is, is, is a bit of a marketing. I, I really hope that I can, uh, I can see you uh, all in Budapest in a year's time for the next conference. Actually, we are working towards that. Uh, and the other one is, is, is to share some of the, uh, the, uh, the changes that has recently happened in Hungary and the way that I see uh, design, not as a tool, but as a mindset and as a strategy. And uh, my goal here today is, is to leave you with, with one idea that I'm toying with. Uh, I mean, I, I've learned that uh, last year at the conference, I didn't even prepare slides. Uh, there's no point. Uh, it's, it's better to, to throw something out in the crowd. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do that today. Uh, and also, I will have a question uh, for you to ponder on uh, during the, uh, the break afterwards. So before I do that, uh, just to give you a, a bit of context, where I'm coming from, why I'm standing here, and, and a bit of a context, institutional context from, from the country, uh, Hungary, that I'm coming. So personally, uh, 2003, I, I, I come back from Iraq, uh, and, uh, and I, I find myself in the dungeons of our MOD uh, with, a, with the task design soft. We didn't have special forces, uh, and we have come a long way. So we have a brigade now. I uh, just recently announced a uh, regional success. Uh, I think that's, that's a spectacular uh, sort of trajectory uh, to go, uh, especially for a, a relatively small country uh, for, for Hungary. You know, and, and, and we went with a blank piece of paper, not much knowledge, a lot of help from, from all kinds of friends. Uh, but I became a misfit. Uh, if, if I wasn't that, you know, during this process, while we were designing SAF, and I was doing it at the DMOD, the Joint Forces, and then I was uh, commanding our, our, our one and only SAF unit at that time before I went to the US, I have, my, my mindset has, has, has changed a lot. Uh, then I went to the US for, for seven years. I spent four years at, an, at, at NATO, a like common transformation. And for those of you who, do, who doesn't know NATO very well, actually NATO is perfectly designed uh, in a way to, to deal with, with the VUCA environment today. So Allied Command Operations here in Europe, they're focusing on, on, on current ops. You know, they, they plan ahead like 12 months, not, not much more, uh, and dealing with, with current operations, generating the forces, testing them, and, and, and actually you know, overseeing uh, what's happening in, in that ground. But ACT, Allied Command Transformation in Norfolk, Virginia, on the other end of the pond, uh, has the luxury of, of, of thinking ahead. Uh, in the future. They're doing a lot of foresight analysis and uh, they have documents uh, like uh, strategic foresight analysis and FFAO, Future Framework for uh, Alliance Operations. Uh, so uh, I, I was involved in, in, in that community for four years and then SECTI picked me and put me in, into the Pentagon uh, to align the, uh, the, the, the force development uh, for our biggest ally with the other 28 uh, in the alliance. So that was quite an experience, but my hobby there was innovation. 
So uh, General Mercier at that time was very curious about what's happening on the fringes that Ash Carter started as, as, as the defense secretary to see the circumstance, uh, you know, DIUX, Co and, and all other entities who were doing innovation and how, you know, we could use that uh, in, in, in other NATO countries. Uh, so last July I went back to Hungary and my hobby became my profession. So I have innovation in my title. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or, or not. Some people say that, not necessarily. But uh, I, I had to, to overlay innovation on, on our research and development process. And here comes the challenge, the, uh, the organizational challenge that, that we are facing in, 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 in Hungary right now. Uh, we're doubling the defense budget in the next five years. You would think that's a good thing. Uh, but in the, the, the past 15 years, you know, we, we didn't have much to spend. And uh, it's not just us, it, it's other countries in, in, in the region who are facing, I guess, the, the same, I would say, problem. Uh, because our goal, goal definitely is, is, is to create the future force. And in uh, what we call the Zrinje 2026 uh, project, which is a uh, seven-year development project, it's nothing less of a, of a digital transformation. But to, to explain what, what we are facing, uh, I, I want to cite uh, Astro Teller. I'm not sure if I have to introduce him. And anyone who, who doesn't know what, who Astro Teller is? Okay, there are a few. So Astro is, is the grandson of Edward Teller, who had something to do with the, uh, the, the nuclear bomb by here. Hungarian, by the way. Uh, and uh, then Astro is leading Google X now. So the, uh, they're, they're doing all the, uh, the, the research and development for a, a, a company called Google that you probably heard about. And uh, so the way he, he explains uh, the, the problem is, is that because of the exponential uh, change in technology, uh, about 100 years ago, it was about 25 years for a new technology to spread globally. Uh, and we humans uh, needed about 15 years to adapt. But right now, because of the cycles are actually shortening, it's about five to seven years. We humans uh, are not that fast, and, and, and we are moving on a linear trajectory. So it, it takes about 10 years to get used to the, the new gadgets or, or whatever that, that new, new technology is. So we are already behind the curve, and that delta is increasing. So he, he believes that the, uh, the, the problem, the, the real challenge, it's, it's adap adaptation organizational learning. And if we do not reinvent the ways we learn, then uh, that delta is just going to increase. So that's happening in Hungary as well. And, and if we are designing the future force, and if we are buying the, the nice Gucci type of equipment, okay, how do we get there in seven years? Because innovation isn't about having the, the, the best uh, tech. I mean, uh, during my soft training, one of the first soft truths is people are more important than technology, so I know that well. It's how do we push that down to the warfighter faster uh, than than any of our, our adversaries. And, and I think that's where the real challenge lies. It's, a, it's, a, it's an organizational transformation problem. It's not really a technological problem. Mm -hmm. If you have money, you can buy stuff. Um, so, uh, and uh, I, I came across design in, in many ways. Uh, I, I wanted to, to learn. I'm a believer of lifelong learning. So I, uh, <coughs> I went to, to Stanford. I, I, I learned about the squiggly lines and, and the honeycomb and, and the intersecting circles and all that stuff. Then I met Ben. Uh, by accident, and, and I have seen that there is a whole guerrilla movement uh, uh, which is thinking about design thinking, military applied design. And I was very happy, and we started to think, okay, how, how, how we spread the, uh, the word. Uh, but going back to Hungary, I realized that design is much more than just a tool and a, and a toolkit. It's a mindset and, a, and it's a strategy. So as a mindset, it, it helps organizations to develop new uh, competencies, uh, exploring complex problems. It, it has been discussed before. I'm not going to spend much time on it. Uh, and it explores the boundaries of the known and uh, imagines what could be. So these are all very good in a VUCA environment where we don't know where we are headed uh, and where we have some room to maneuver to experiment with things. Uh, luckily, in Hungary, there has been several changes. There is an innovation and technology ministry now at the government level. Uh, they are very supportive of these things. And we just uh, established the Modernization Institute in, in, in January. And their very job is to do that experimentation. And actually, the, the chief of defense told them that uh, they're uh, not just allowed to do, do, do so, but they're expected to, uh, to, to do that and fail. So uh, that brings me to, brings me to strategy. 
because uh, my, my idea is, is don't bring me solutions, bring me problems. Uh, and, and this problem-focused sort of design-oriented mindset where we don't actually focus on the skill set, but we are putting people into a certain kind of mindset uh, is, is, is more important than, than ever. And the, the whole process of designers, you know, uh, don't uh, search for a solution. They, uh, they want to define the real problem first. Uh, they explore options, you know, emergence uh, happens, and, uh, and then convergence is, is actually a, a strategic approach, I believe, that we can, we can utilize and, 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 and we can uh, put into practice when we are designing the new force. And the, the, uh, the concept that I, I, I wanted to leave with is, uh, is what I call <coughs> Mission Command 2.0. So where we are right now, uh, Mission Command is probably well known to everyone. It's the central intent and the decentralized execution. It's, it's much more than that. But for, for simplicity's, simplicity's uh, sake, let's just concentrate on, on, on those two elements. And what's happening today? The first thing is that no one commander that I know of uh, is capable of handling uh, complex situations any longer. So the leadership models that we had, and we heard about uh, the, the beautiful concept of MADIS and, and BA, I see that, uh, that, or, or that, that it's from a leadership perspective. BA, you know, it's Achilles, you know, he's leading the troops, he's the myth of the, the leader uh, who is always on the forefront, he's a demigod, and, or she is a demigod, and, uh, and, and everyone just falls uh, behind him and they, they conquer the, the, the whole world. And, and we still have that, that concept. Uh, and it's misleading. Uh, Metis has been you know, a lesser, lesser form of warfare for guerrillas, for terrorists for a long time. And uh, they, they didn't really uh, uh, acknowledge it, especially in big militaries. Right now what we see, uh, adversaries have realized you know, that if we incorporate, we integrate the two, uh, these two mindsets from a leadership perspective, uh, you will have the gray zone warfare and all those solutions that uh, for NATO especially it's really hard to grapple with. So uh, that's, the, uh, that's the, the, the first point. And, and then in mission command, so if, if, if intent comes from the top, let's say, it's still emergent. So uh, many leaders trying to form that, let's say, collaborative intent. And one of the, the things that I have learned from, from design, I'm not a design expert by, uh, by any uh, means, but it's, 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 it's a collaborative and inclusive process. So in a strategic way, uh, that's one, one aspect how we can use it for, for what I call Mission Command 2.0, is, is, is change the leadership concept that we have right now and, and make it more collaborative and have a collaborative intent instead of the intent. And then we can disseminate. The other one is technology comes in because we have decentralized execution, but this is need not decentralized execution of small teams any longer. It's human machine teaming. Everyone is talking about that. So if, if we have a collaborative intent instead, then we have human machine teaming of decentralized execution where you know, uh, autonomous swarms uh, will, uh, will dominate the, uh, the future uh, uh, in, in, in a very short time. Uh, and this is changing everything. Uh, and and if, if it's changing the warfare as we know it, then we need new tools to figure out where we are headed. And it was a great presentation by, by Jeremiah, you know, and from others as well, to learn about everyone is, is grappling with the, the, the same uh, sort of, 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 of problems. We in Hungary, we certainly do. And, uh, and we realize that, that we need to do something. Uh, we need to, to collect best practices, uh, share lessons learned. Uh, especially in countries who are doing rearmament, and they are equipping themselves with future equipment, but they don't know how to, to actually get there, how to operate that equipment. Uh, because you have to learn that, but moreover, you have to, to, to learn uh, what the future brings, and, and you ha have to, to, to experiment with, uh, with that in, 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 in new ways. So uh, my point here is, is, is that you have to create space. And creating that space doesn't come easy. Uh, so I've, I've, I've been, uh, ever since I returned in, in, in the last eight months, I've been experimenting with circus dance. We are, we are putting into place uh, entities that are not per se in the command structure, but are supporting the, uh, the defense uh, uh, innovation and, 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 and the, the defense industrial base building uh, at the same time. Uh, my boss always asks me, you know, whether if it's going to be successful or not. 
Uh, I'm very honest with him. I have no idea. But I think the biggest risk that we have right now, if we don't try, uh, because if we don't do that, you know, that, that train is just going to leave the station and we're not going to be on it. Uh, and since it's red, and I've learned from the previous uh, speech, you know, that if I look at the clock, you know, the more I talk, the more time I have. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so my, my question is, so what? If I, if I look around in the room here, uh, I have a deja vu moment again. I mean, uh, I have a, a blank piece of paper. It's, 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 it's a bunch of girls. It's, it's like my, my three other comrades. We were sitting in the Dungeons and the MOD with, you know, with, that, with the job design Hungarian soft. How the, on earth are we going to do that? We didn't know. Here, I think that we have a, a, a really great expertise. Uh, other people are just, just curious about it. But how do we raise this? And we have been contemplating this with, with, with Ben uh, beforehand. And the institutionalized design in a better way. There are national ways of, of doing it. And, and some nations are doing it better, some others just starting to realize that they need it. Uh, while at NATO, I, I was a firm believer that we have to raise it to uh, uh, design education to, uh, to a NATO level. So if the problem is organizational learning, then one of the, uh, the solutions I, I think could be uh, designed that can help uh, NATO as a whole uh, and nations uh, if, we, uh, if we are able to institutionalize it. So how do we, how do we go about that is, 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 is my question. And, and, and I think uh, that during our sideline conversations after this, uh, maybe, uh, maybe you want to wanna talk about it, because I think that's the collective mission uh, in this room. Thanks very much. Well, it's an honor to be here, like last year in, uh, in Ottawa, and currently I'm working in the Bundeswehr Joint Forces Operations Command. And Ben told something about the Trojan Horse yesterday. I am the Trojan Horse in the German Bundeswehr Joint Forces Operations Command. I'm Dutch. And I'm being trained and educated at the German Co uh, General Command Staff College, speak a little bit of German, and they put me to work as a German. And uh, what I got to know in the Bundeswehr Joint Forest Operations Command is they've got an advanced machine bureaucracy. When it works, it works neatly. It works neatly. It is very efficient. However, when it comes to planning, wicked problems, uh, it becomes a little bit of tricky. And I brought in, I sparkled with some design dust in my, in my planning groups. And people were unaware because I did it in stealth mode. And slowly, this is actually the way to go in, in the Bundeswehr. So, Sunke, don't, don't, don't tell anybody back home. <laughs> Could you speak a little bit louder? I cannot... <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> um, but I'll start, actually, to go down to memory lane, going back to 2009. 2009 was the year I was a detachment commander, PRT, in Afghanistan. I went... When there, my command said, Jeff, you're going to Deru district on the border with Helmand and Kandahar. You're not in the center of gravity. You're not in the main effort for the next half year. Keep it quiet. Whatever you do, don't make a mess out of it. Good luck. So I came there and I looked around. It's like, all right, let's make a plan. But, but yeah, what a plan on what? For who? For the people? For me? For the Afghan government? Oh, what's the problem? Do I need to kill Taliban? Um, so I said, yeah, all right. Hmm. So first I started to do some patrols to get, get, an, uh, get to know the environment. And while I was on a patrol, I was walking and I had a functional specialist who was an entrepreneur in daily life. He, he walked with me. He was there a little bit longer. And we were, we were walking and far away, I s it was already late. I saw a guy digging. I was like, oh, I need to take a look at that one. It's an easy guy. He's digging. It's near the road. I know where it's going. Must be an IED. And he started to talk to me, he's like, hey, Jeff, did you happen you know you were standing on a tomato plant? It's like, keep quiet. So I, I, I used my assault rifle, look through, uh, look through the binoculars, it's like, oh, I can't, what's happening over there? So, so he continued and said, did Jeff, 
do you see where we're walking here in the green zone? It's like, shut up. And while we approached, I found out it's a farmer because the sun was about to disappear and he was changing the little sand irrigation canals to irrigate on night. Didn't know they did it. And then he started to talk to me. He said, you stepped on a tomato plant, yeah? But if that farmer just bind that up to a stick, he would have an increase of 50% on his harvest. Okay. And he said, what if, we do, if he creates a net to protect the tomatoes from direct sunlight, he have an additional harvest uh, for win of 50%. So he, two very simple things, he could create a 100% increase. <coughs> and then I started to think, like, hey, we were in the same patrol. We worked in the same area. He sees things different as I do. I saw Taliban, but it was a farmer. He saw opportunities. So and that started, well, actually, a, a discourse on, on thinking. So we went a little bit more in the, in the environment, and, and I, I, I turned to the population because we said, whose problem is it? Uh, not me. I'm going away. The people stay there. So we talked to population, and there are a lot of poppy. And I had to report the poppy, and then the poppy eradication for force came in, and they burned everything down. So I was like, that's not a good solution. Because who is growing poppy here? It's the poorest people who do not have the skills for agriculture because growing poppy is very easy. And then the Taliban comes to harvest the opium and people get a little bit of money. And we talked to the people, they would really wanted to do something different instead of growing poppy. I said, what would you want to do? Well, I want to grow grain. And in the, in the areas where we were very present, we could teach people and we could create a market for grain based on what the locals thought was necessary. But on the outskirts, people also said, yeah, well, you're not all that often here. We also have to live with the Taliban, but we also want to do something else. So th that's what we talked about yesterday, yesterday evening. I said, well, you know, I saw a lot of wheat plants. Why don't you grow wheat? If you grow wheat, it's still the first step <coughs> into agriculture. And when growing wheat, it's the first step of having a different market as only the Taliban, because you also have a, sort of a normal market around. And then you can slowly continue to, to agricultural and to grow grain, for instance. These kind of concepts we worked out in a plan. And I incorporated the population, I incorporated, uh, I, I did uh, actually was thinking like, what should the Taliban think of our plan? So we made a small plan, but I was very unaware of what I was doing. Back home, and I ended up in a discourse in, in, in our army, and they said, we have been in Uruzgan province, and our soldiers were, in the time, engaged in more and more combat actions. But we did win every firefight, but we lost grip on the, on the province. So I started to think, well, what was it? Because in, in our district, in my six, seven uh, months, it's like, I, we had a different perspective, things were different. What, what was it, what we did different instead of what was happening uh, in the rest of the province? So we started to talk on decision-making processes, paradigms, and, and eventually I, started, I, started, I started up like, do, are there any comparable studies? So we ended up in studies like uh, the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, what, what the, uh, the Americans uh, came up with, and I got up from an old mate of me who got to SAMS, and uh, because I got to learn, they teach uh, design at, at SAMS, and he was just returned, and I called him and said, hey, can you tell me a little bit about it? I said, well, come back in three weeks, because then Ben's coming over uh, to meeting up. So that's why accident, I ran into Ben, and I asked him over to our place. And that was pretty much 2013 when we started up design thinking, uh, incorporating in design, in, in, in doctrine, not prescriptive, but more as like embracing that we need a different approach to look at things. And we started up a curriculum in our captain's career course, who wants to become a major, and also for a lieutenant colonel career course for the guys who want to become lieutenant colonel. And that gained momentum, and what I really liked is that out of nowhere, the special forces came to me and said, Jeff, you need to come here because we need this. We, because we need to plan the unforeseen. We need to feel comfortable in dealing with uncertainty and complexity. And we sat down and we developed an adjusted concept for them alone. And a couple of years later, they, 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 uh, well, 
they went into, into Africa and they used it as they still use it today, but uh, also in, in their operations uh, in the field. And actually in a couple of years we gained some, some, some momentum over there. And The end of the story over there was uh, I should go to Germany, I was about to leave. And actually the timing was just perfect because we had, had some people who followed the courses, we gained some momentum, we gained a critical mass. And what I also noticed is the students became the teachers. And it was time for Jeffrey to go, because leave it, because it's not your child. And so I went up to Germany. I will take you through a couple of slides, because what is it from a Dutch perspective on the design, what uh, we perceive as, uh, as important? Oh. We talked about problems, we talked about solutions. Uh, and one of our point of view is design is not bound to any military level of warfare. It's bound to complexity, contextual complexity. Also, you need to keep in mind there is no truth. One does not have rights. We cannot discuss. We need to go for co-creation. We need to go for dialogue. How can we do it? building using our telescopes, our mental telescopes. And my telescope, my mental telescope is who I build of lenses, but those lenses consist of who I am, how I think, and what I've been taught. And we need to bring that together based on a dialogue. Further, we need to take into account, we have took into account that conflicts are by people, between people, amongst people, just like Sir Rupert Smith already mentioned lots of years ago. And human interaction is per se, uh, well, an open system and bound in complexity. So did those guys have answers? Well, you do not have to disregard everything, but also what they've looked into is bound in their context, in their time frame. Is there a Bible? Or is this document, COPD, I studied it pretty intensively because when you, need, when you want to be critical of something, you, you need to go into it as well. Or does NATO institutionalize COPD into, now did NATO institutionalize operational level warfare into a linear decision making process? Because that's how it's taught. It's taught poorly. Uh, it's not well understood. In, in, in its essence, the COPD isn't that wrong. It really got some systems thinking. It's got designerish thinking in pretty much all phases of that process. But is that a silver bullet? No, it's not. But for NATO countries who are not able to conduct operational level of warfare on their own, that's the platform that binds us together. So we cannot just throw it away. You do not throw away your shoes, your old shoes, before you have new ones. By design, is anybody doing design? I've, I visited the Walter Reed Hospital uh, in, in the United States and I came to actually an, a very interesting discussion with a brain surgeon. Because back home they said design. The young guys, that's something for the young guys. We're too old, we, we, we don't get it anymore. And while I was talking to the brain surgeon also about the capacity of the brain, also with brain injury, to recover, to make new connections. And we took the discussion to another level. Actually, everybody can learn pretty much everything. However, you need to bring that person into specific circumstances where they are stimulated and where, the, where that creation st slowly starts uh, to take place. So also in design education, or if you start do doing design, don't put everybody in a room and just throw the same thing at them because everybody learns at a different rate. I experience people my age, 20% say, bring it on. Give me more. 20% say, it's not for me. 60% say, yeah, I know what you mean. I won't be a front runner, but yeah, I could participate. And you can, you can influence those amounts. You can take people along. Finally, um, our fit 
of design into our organization is of is operations process authority to command that's the commander whether it's a civilian or a military that's not that important but a commander in all our organization he is what germans say schwerpunkt he influenced the system the com but the commander has wicked problems needs to have some understanding in order to create a narrative commander's guidance or to formulate his intent because in the Netherlands, in our forces, we do use mission command and, uh, in peacetime and in operations. And using design as a way to create understanding, to form the narrative, to create an intent, to put into your decision-making process, to execute your leadership, to do what is right at this moment now. It sounds a bit of opportunistic, but when you do the commander's guidance, when you do have, the, you set the boundaries with an, uh, that you're subordinate officers have freedom within, they can seize that opportunity. And you can get become proactive instead of reactive. Here I want to let you leave it. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Well join me for a round of applause <laughs> for a very engaging presentation. <laughs> so questions, thoughts, arguments? Thank you. <laughs> I, I, can I give you a thought on a question that, that Ben and I just had a whispered conversation about and I just want to bring it to the group. Look at this, um, this diagram that's up for the operations process at the moment. It looks very similar to the... Thank you. It looks very similar to the, the simplified version of Boyd's decision cycle into the OODA loop. It looks similar to the adaptive campaigning that, that the Australian Army came out with a decade ago. Um, and we were just talking about how it seems that one of the ways in which militaries have convinced themselves that they're innovating is that they've taken a, a three to five step process that was represented as a line and they've turned it into a circle and they've just connected the, the end back to the beginning and now we're telling ourselves that that's brilliant and that's innovative. So I know this is an observation, not a question, but I will end it by thanking the panel uh, because I think you've managed to show us ways in which or talk to us about ways in which you've, you've been able to innovate without just connecting the end of a line to the beginning of a line, but actually rethinking about things, uh, which is one of the themes of the conference. So just an observation on these, these circles and these cycles that, that mm -hmm. seem to be emerging and uh, you know, seem to promise innovation but not quite deliver it. And that's an interesting thing that's emerged through a number of different presentations in this, in this conference. And I'm glad that we're departing from that in our own discourse. Anybody wants to react to this? Well, yeah, I'd like to re react to it. It's the operations process on itself is already existing very long. Uh, it's already there. And uh, uh, I made a remark, you don't throw away your, your old shoes before you have new shoes. Uh, as a practitioner, we need to deal with complexity. We need to establish some things in the field of operations. And uh, yeah, you're right. We, sometimes we say, hey, it's, it, I, I, back in the Netherlands, we see a fit here on the commander who is at the center. But it's suboptimal. It would be it would be maybe the best to start with a blank sheet. However, then we also need to reorganize our complete armed forces. Uh, it's 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 an interesting discourse. So it seems that somebody was intrigued by your slide, uh, Jeffrey, and would like to know more about it. So what is the relationship between outdated national stereotypes such as, as those on your, uh, on, your, on your slide comparing uh, problem solution yeah. uh, based on national uh, identity and design thinking methodologies for solving defense challenges. What is the relationship between... Oh, I'll have to look at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a nice illustration to create, to start, to start up a, a, a discussion or a dialogue. However, in uh, pretty much there is a truth in some, some stereotypes. They do not come out of the blue. Mm -hmm. However, it, to me, it's something, be aware of your own paradigm. Mm -hmm. Be aware that people have other paradigms and that you bring people together based on a dialogue instead of a discussion. It's not I'm right, there is my truth. Uh, no, there, there, it's it, be aware of other uh, paradigms and, and, and create added value by co-creation.
I'd like to echo that. I totally agree with that. And I think there's actually an opportunity in that space as well. I think you can actually harness that. Again, it comes down to the facilitator. But if you're aware of that, and you have other people that have that different mindset, in it, it's actually very powerful. Those are the differences that actually can bring something to the table. It can go completely off the rails. Be forewarned, your mileage may vary. But in many cases, I think it's something that we can use. Up front. I just want to draw something to you. So you said yesterday that uh, the best way to predict the future is to design it. And since yesterday, you're all talking about design processes starting with problems. Now I know we're saying problem setting, okay, but this still, this is not, I offer you, again I argue, that this is not, this is too late. Going into a design process when you have a problem in your head is too late. Mm. And that goes back, where is Antoine? <laughs> <laughs> to the Kairos thing from before. Think of your opening entry point as emergence, not as a problem. There is emergence, there is trends. You were talking about, we talked about foresight. We're seeing trends, we're seeing some phenomena that are of interest to us, okay? They intrigue something in us, our intuition. It's emergence. We don't know if it's going to be a threat or there is a potential there. So I offer stop thinking of your entry point as problems and start thinking of them as emergence. And then maybe you have the potential, again, to position yourself in reality, in the emergence, so that you can exploit potentials and not just solve problems. That's too late, and I think that's also the difference between operational design, I'm, I can't believe I'm saying that, and <laughs> 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 Anybody wants to bounce on that? No? No, you good? I think that's right on the money. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. David? Uh, yes, gentlemen, thank you. Um, this could be applied to all, all of you all. So, um, Sir, thank you for your vignette in Afghanistan. Uh, one thing that kind of came out clear to me was empathy. Um, when you started empathizing for the, for the farmer. And uh, my question to you or anybody else is, um, how do we make our learners uh, aware of empathy? Uh, and can we possibly uh, emphasize with DEOs? And do we have a kind of a bias against uh, empathizing with those you know, potential adversaries? Well, I would say we need to be aware that we're all biased and need to know your own bias in order to be able to look, to look outward. Uh, I, I also had two things in mind, actually. Uh, one is the, uh, the case study that I, I was reading about New York uh, and, uh, you know, the unsafe uh, environment in the underground. So the police chief decided that, uh, you know, all police officers has to come with the, 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 uh, the underground uh, to work. Uh, in three or four months' time, uh, it, it, it was the safest place uh, to, uh, to be. So it's, it's creating that kind of environment. But at the same time, I think there you need to talk about a lot about uh, psychological safety, uh, the, the kind of environment where, where, where you can share ideas. Actually, this is a culture we, that we are, we are, we are facing in Hungary. And, and we are very far from psychological safety. It, it might be the old Russian tradition still kicking in or something like that, but people don't speak up. Uh, they wait for the authority to, to, to say, and then they just agree. And, and, and maybe sideline conversations, they, they, they are able to, uh, to do that. But unless you can create that kind of environment, uh, people will, will not empathize. So put them in, in their shoes, and, but also at the same time create psychological safety. Before going to Donna, I think that the question just over there segue nicely in, in what you just said. Uh, it's addressed to you, Emre, if you want to read it. Uh, how has the long shadow of Soviet centralized decision making <coughs> continued to be a barrier to culturally and militarily rituals, doctrine, practices for the Hungarian defense forces? Yeah, it's still there. So I'm, uh, uh, we're, we're facing it. But I'm, I'm looking at it as, as an opportunity. With, with technology, we are doing it. I mean, going from <coughs> T-72s to, to Leopard 2 A7s, that's, a, that's a huge. That's, that's several generations in there. But our leadership has, has looked at it, and they said, OK, let, this is an opportunity now. I mean, we've been using legacy Russian equipment, so let's buy Airbus helicopters. 
uh, because that's the future, and, 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 and we're going to have those. Uh, we could do the same culturally as well. Uh, at least that's my, my idea. So why don't we jump from legacy Russian-type mindset to Mission Command 2.0, then again, as you, up, you said, Afra, you know, don't you know, uh, try to solve the problem that we have. Try to, to predict the trends and, and try to bridge this uh, and, 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 and make a, a, a generational jump. How to do that is, 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 is the problem, uh, I, I guess. And, and in, in, in that, we need uh, godfathers and evangelists. Uh, godfathers at the top. And, and some evangelists in, in the force, uh, the guerrilla corps, uh, which will, will sort of spread the word. It's not going to be easy, I know. Uh, Donna, a question, and then we'll, we have to move to the next uh, panel. Okay. Hi, this question is for Henry and whoever else on the panel would like to answer it. So you had mentioned um, the difference between linear and exponential. Innovation. And I yep. think that's a very important concept around change for the 21st century. And there's not a lot of understanding around exponential change and what that means. And um, especially around technology, because things are moving at a global level very quickly. And most organizations um, that I work with are very thinking, very local, very linear, and it's, it's a very slow process of innovation. So my question to you is, and this is building an OFRA, OFRA's idea around emergence, because that is the forward-looking approach um, in the current state and future. So when you look at technology, um, do you see any types of emerging issues on the horizon? And these are like weak signals that are potential signs of disruption for the military that are creating seeds for the next 5 to 10 to 15 years. Yeah, all over the place. And, and, and let me just re-emphasize. So the rainy 2026, it might be a seven-year uh, development process or whatever you name it. And I'm trying to communicate it to the force. It's, it's for them, it's really hard to understand. But they're going to see as much change in the next seven years as they have seen in the past 20. And, and that's very hard for them to understand. So that's one thing where foresight actually comes into the picture. And with, going back to the technology question, it's really important because seven years is something that we can sort of relatively, with some safety, we can predict, uh, at least technology-wise. It's, it's not a coincidence that, uh, that uh, Mr. Mattis, when, when he, he was developing the new strategy for, for the US as well, they, they looked ahead seven years. That was his direction and guidance. Um, and yes, we, uh, we, we, we have identified some of these trends, and, and, and most of these trends are, 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 are with, with, with the digital uh, transformation. So uh, when I mentioned human machine teaming, it's, it's, it's drone technology, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the whole AI spectrum that's, that's disrupting uh, uh, technology. But at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm still emphasizing one critical point here. It's, it's human mind. I mean, there is a convergence, and, and we are talking about technology, but, but psychology, neurobiology, pharmacology, we don't talk about it, but it's there. And, and, and technology has created a space there where we humans, uh, first time in history, can catch up. Uh, I mean, uh, I heard this, you know, Navy SEALs learning a language in six weeks, which normally takes a year. but. Uh, the, 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 the sort of realm of possible, you look at surfing, surfing example. In the last 15 years, there was a 10x increase in, in, uh, in, 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 in capacity that, that we can do. And on and, and all extreme sports, it's the same. So yes, the, uh, the technology question is very relevant. But at the same time, I always emphasize that, OK, this is a segue, an opportunity for us humans to, to catch up. If we don't do that, this whole human machine teaming conversation could, could, could go into a very different direction that we don't like. Great. Join me for a round of applause. Uh, so we'll take just a, a wee break to let the next presenter mic up. Uh, and just a quick thing, uh, we've got a, a website for those interested. It's called the Archipelago of Design. Just Google it. And you'll find a lot of material, videos, and, and stuff if you want to learn more about design. Thank you.